From Chicago's Can TV, a look at the week's events is reported in the newspapers, in the blogs and online, and on radio and TV. This is Chicago Newsroom. And hi again. Welcome to the show. Well, before we get started on today's conversation, an update on last week's show. We were taken to task by a viewer, David Wisniewski, who um, sent our conversation about environmental issues on the southeast side, specifically those piles of petroleum coke, ignored the people who are employed in those industries and who make it clear during public hearings that they feel environmental regulations are hurting employment. Mr. Winooski uh, objected to subsidies that have been given to so-called green projects in the area that get government money but don't really employ anybody, things like the solar collector plant in West Pullman. He said, here's a quote, he said, there was a 50, uh, I'm sorry, a $90 billion clean energy stimulus in 2009. And while the amount of wind and solar has doubled in the past few years, the renewable energy jobs have not. Renewables are capital projects and do not require much labor. Put up a windmill or some solar panels and for the next 25 years, they'll produce energy. But uh, outside of an occasional ma maintenance job once in a while, they're, while they're up and running, they're labor free. Well, I think our point was that the proposed gasification plant, which would be a heavy polluter, would require subsidies for decades because the product would be so expensive to produce. So the subsidies for solar are in research and development, are on the front end, so these plants don't employ a lot of people, but they do provide clean, almost free energy. You know, you get the idea. Anyway, that debate continues, and you can read his comment in full at chicagonewsroom.com, or I'm sorry, .org, chicagonewsroom.org, and you can add your own comment to and we'll just see what happens, see if we can keep a, a dialogue going on. Anyway, on today's show, some big stories journalists are covering and some big stories about journalism too. And of course, pensions and politics and all the rest of it. Tom Clark yes, Ken is Davis. back. Um, emeritus of uh, Community Media Workshop. Congratulations Thank on you. your 40 years at CMW. And I know you've been uh, appropriately uh, celebrated for your work. You got something coming up. There's going to be like they're a doing Cliff a roast and thing? toast on uh, roast and toast at the Cliff Dwellers on May fifteenth. That should be. And I have no idea what they have planned or plotted, <laughs> but we'll see. I, I I volunteered myself for this uh -huh. and uh -huh. try to keep our scholarship. Amy fun Schumer a little, a little is full. going to be leading it. Well, we I, I don't know. I gave them some <laughs> names, but uh, no one has. Have they contacted you yet, Cheryl? <laughs> I think yeah. we've all been contacted. Yeah, yeah, yeah. About that. Yes, we've all received the email. Well, anyway, congratulations to you, Tom. And also Cheryl Corley joining us once again from NPR here in Chicago. Great to have you on the show, Thank Cheryl, you. as Thank always. You. And Andrew Schrader is joining us again, a uh, second Thank time, you. back uh, this time, uh, well, still with the Better Government Association, yeah. but this time as an author of a piece in the Sun-Times, yes. because that's the way you guys roll. You write stuff for... <laughs> whoever wants to, to carry your stuff, right? Yep. And that's journalism, and that's one of the things that we'll be talking about today. But since we've mentioned the August Chicago Sun-Times, um, they made news this week by deciding once and for all, well, let me see what the Sun-Times had to say about their own comment boards. This is the editor, Craig Newman. It too often turns into a morass of negativity, racism, hate speech, and general trollish behavior that detract from the content. That's what the Sun Times says about their own comment board. So they shut them off. Couldn't agree with his comments more. <laughs> <laughs> um, I find myself following Sun Times and, for that matter, Crane's comments less and less because. There's a certain amount of mostly guys that seem to not have much to do during the day, and they're on there trolling, and they're yeah. pretty misogynist and racist a yeah. lot of the time. Well, I mean, and, it really um, does seem like it's about 10 with, with a lot of comments about that socialist Muslim Kenyan <laughs> thrown in for know, good measure, right, even right, if the story right. had nothing to do with the president. There, there yeah. can be a, a story about a warehouse fire on the northwest side, and then the first comment will be about, well, it, that's what you get when you elect a, a Democratic president. Uh, I, I feel for Jim Kirk because I really saw this development. Um, we're trying to improve the system. Um, you know, uh, wait readers, you'll have a chance to comment again. It's really a sign of how lean. Did you say wait readers? Yeah, wait, I thought wait, you wait, said wait. white readers. Well, no, no. <laughs> wait, wait readers. Well, you can comment again someday once we figure out the uh -huh. system. Yeah. They're, the Sun Times is struggling without many resources, and basically the problem is they don't have someone to yeah. moderate the All discussion. Right. And because it's so off the wall, mm -hmm. they've decided to take the discussion down. Yeah. Yeah. I thought one of the ironies of this development was the very day this got announced. You have Feeder and Steinberg in kind of a sideshow mm -hmm. conversation. Mm -hmm. 
that shouldn't have been out there. I mm -hmm. mean, it was kind of a personal thing that, right, you know, right. was, uh, I guess, part of what we pay for was social media, but both gentlemen could have picked a different place, maybe a bar to yeah, have their conversation. Yeah. And well, <laughs> I mean, I'm sorry. No, I was just going to say the argument, uh, it was interesting that you, you, at the beginning of the show, talked about people being able to uh, comment uh, mm -hmm. on the website. And uh, uh, I think it's just part of the media landscape right now. Mm -hmm. We just expect that, that people can do that. I mean, there's, there's nothing that says the Sun-Times, which is a private enterprise, has to have this forum for people to say whatever they want to say. So the argument about free speech is mm -hmm. like, well, maybe, but it's not a public entity. Right, right. Um, so uh, I, I think that that's interesting. But I do think that, you know, everybody expects that to be part of yeah. media these days. So that's where the Sun-Times It's about engaging with the brand in a yes, way. I mean, yes. people, right. I think people, especially with the rise of social media, I mean, people are used to commenting now. They're used to posting their opinions, yes. you know, whatever mm -hmm. they may be. And there has to be, it seems to me, there has to be a happy medium there. Right. Um, somehow, some way, they have to get it. Because I think, you know, as, as print becomes less important, you know, the digital age um, or the digital media becomes more important, that is going to be a very, you know, central part of this. And, you know, people are going to want to and actually demand it. Your consumers yeah, are going to, yeah. your readers are going to demand to be able to comment on it. Well, it's things. kind of ironic that it's, you know, it is ChicagoSuntimes.com. Well, they did that for a reason. Right. I mean, that's <laughs> been Kirk's thing. Yeah, I know. Want. And, right. and yeah. you know, it's, it's ChicagoSuntimes.com, but don't write any comments to us because we don't anyway but I mean I, I really do see that they have they have real issues to deal with and I was wondering what you guys think about like the Tribune and others have gone to this Facebook posting deal where you uh, I, do you actually have to have a Facebook account to comment I yes, think you do I right? so, because yes. you're basically signing in through Facebook, through Facebook and they right, think that right. kind of third party Oh, this is a real person with a Facebook account. Yeah, it eliminates we'll the anonymous. Some right, of it. right. I think it eliminates the anonymous. I don't think it eliminates the comments? misogynist, the racist, <laughs> yeah. off the wall yeah. comments right. necessarily. Right. Because you mean some of those people are on Facebook, is what you're saying? Yes. Yeah, yes, you are. Yeah. But you do have a kind of moderating yeah. influence there that you, you don't. It's have a little if, different yeah. arena. I mean, I don't, I don't know if I'm correct in this observation, but my sense of it has been that since the Tribune went that way, they just have fewer comments on stories. And I, maybe that's because by making it an extra step yeah, or two, yeah. it's just a little bit harder to do. And so you don't just <laughs> hit the, the button. But right now it's so easy. You, you know, it was, I should right. say, until they suspended right. it. But I mean, you could just boom your name, whatever you want to call yourself that day, right, and then right. blah, 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 blah. Right. You know, Right. I mean, it's instant yeah. gratification. Yeah, and having that uh, other avenue, I think, means that you really want to comment on the story, right? As right. opposed to right. you know just, just, just blathering general. on or whatever, right. Right. or being right. attack mode, <laughs> yeah. which, is, which yeah. is part of what yeah. the dynamic I think is that people are seeing they have an outlet to attack whatever. It's just I, kind I, of in their it DNA. It boils to down do to a lot. You see a lot of back because <laughs> I notice it because uh, when our stories do run, the sometimes I do read the comments and I do notice. You know, you'll get this back and forth mm -hmm. among the people where it's you know he says this and then <clears> it, <throat> it keeps to just sort of spirals. Right. Um, right. And you're right. At the end, it's so far away from if the story was here. I mean, these guys are whoever. It'll are, always yeah. end up with if it's only these people would have control of their children or something yeah. along <laughs> those lines. <laughs> but um, you know, you you raised the thing, <coughs> Andrew, about. Um, moderation and and I do think that's really the key to this. I mean, there are places and and you know, we often cite our good friend Eric Zorn, but I, I think Zorn does such a great job of of cultivating commentary. Mm -hmm. I mean, he has the commentariat. He's got people who engage in these, you know, weeks long debates about things and it's interesting to read. It's actual so, content. Yeah. It's worth reading. Mm. So you can do it if you are willing to spend the time and the energy to do it. But And of course at one point he turned off his comments. He yeah. just kind of took right. a break right. because the conversation had heated up and wasn't mm -hmm. going anywhere and he right. figured out a way to come back. As a columnist who kind of got into this blogging commentary business early on, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I do look at him um, mm -hmm. as someone who's trying to figure out how to make it work because yeah. um, there are actually very few places where I'm engaging the comment part. I, I will say the reader is one place yes, where absolutely. I mm -hmm. see when Ben does a column, uh, Jarowski does a column, 
there's an interesting conversation <laughs> going on off of it. Yeah. Um, Mostly about Ben is an idiot. Well, that but <laughs> too. But, but, but you know, there, there's a back and forth yeah. that, in ca that, 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 <clears throat> that takes place there that yeah. I think is at the very least entertaining, and that, that's an element of good journalism. It is. Mm -hmm. It is. In order to engage the reader or the viewer, you that's have that. to have some entertainment value. Mm -hmm. And I don't mean the latest celebrity. There just has to be some right, narrative right. engagement. Well, and I, think, I think, yeah, yeah, I was just going to say, I, I think the comments on NPR are typically uh, pertain to the story. Yes, they absolutely. Uh, uh, advance absolutely. the story. Right. Not all the time. Right. Uh, you have people have found us. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, know, yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and that yeah. page, but uh, but I think you're right about there being certain places where you can go where you're well, oh, okay, well, I'll yeah. read the comments too. Yeah. Well, I, I, again, it might have something to do with my radio roots, but I, I've always believed that these, that comment boards that are well moderated mm -hmm. are like a good radio call-in show, mm -hmm. a good one, uh, where you got a lot of people who are just really enjoying the give and take. Especially and when you strike a nerve. I mean, I think as a journalist too, it's a good, you know, it can be very difficult sometimes to gauge, you know, how much of an impact your story may have. Right. And right. I, you know, <coughs> often I'll find myself, you know, at least mentally just referring to the comment poll. Well, wow, mm -hmm. well, that got 50 comments. You yeah. know, I mean, it's yeah. interesting to see how people react. <coughs> yeah. um, you know, it can be very rewarding. It can be very humbling. <laughs> you know, <laughs> <laughs> but um, it, nonetheless, I think it's important. Well, that's one of the that's one of the most intriguing things about the digital age is the, is this ability to. Um, measure everything. Mm -hmm. And you know, we had Charlie Myerson on the show the other day talking about Rivet Radio and <clears throat> he with their new radio system, he can literally see every single person who listens to a story at the beginning of the story and the second at which they turn that story off. Huh. Listen to that, Cheryl Corley radio <laughs> person. So like you could you could go back and they and they literally have this up on screens on the wall in the office I've wow. been over there. So you would go in and you would see the piece that you just did on people walking across the lake or something and and it says that you know 85% stayed with it for a minute and a half and you know whatever. <laughs> I'm not sure what I think about that. It's kind of scary to me. But. Well, I guess it means I can't complain anymore about the length I get. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, um, okay, enough of this. Should we move on to, uh, let's, let's talk about your, your okay. story, Andrew, because it's a very important story you did for the Sun-Times. Um, and, and again, and we're, since we're talking about journalism, this is kind of a cool thing that BGA has kind of set itself up as, a, as an investigative journalism shop, really. We have indeed. Andrew. I mean, we've been around uh, 90 years, but I would say in the last couple of years, we've definitely established a, you know, a stronger presence. Um, mm -hmm. and, and a lot of it is due to these, we had these wonderful media partnerships uh, among them, the Sun-Times, um, as well as um, uh, a number of the TV stations in town. But, uh, so two weeks ago, a little bit about the story. Um, we, I guess I started off with this question of everybody, I think, has talked about John Birch. And everybody that kind of follows Chicago, Chicago police knows about this guy. I mean, he's, he's basically become infamous and he's synonymous with, with torture. Um, I think there's been a lot of coverage out there about how much, um, you know, his crimes have cost the city. Um, it's in the millions. Um, but I had this idea of, well, you know, is this all about John or is the problem bigger than and then, then him and you know his his midnight crew, and so the title of our piece was Beyond Burge. And what we found was that uh, in the last decade, uh, police misconduct has cost over a half billion dollars. And uh, gee, that's a year's worth of pension. That's, yeah. I, that's uh, one yeah. of the things we said. And so then we know what we had this graphic, which I thought was five hundred million dollars, twenty-one million dollars. Yeah. I mean, yeah. I was talking to one alderman, and I literally called him up and said, you know, what do you think about this? What about this thing? And he was silent. I said, I thought we got disconnected. Hello. He goes, yeah. I literally am just picking my jaw off the yeah. floor. Yeah. I said, Well, how much did you think it would be? He said, I don't know, two hundred. Yeah. But never, nobody. It, it just, it really got this this wow factor from mm -hmm. everybody. Yeah. Um, you know, there's this idea of like. You know, for a, a, a cash-strapped city, what could you do with that money? You know, which is just a tantalizing thought. I mean, we came up with, you know, uh, you know, 30 libraries, five new high schools, you know, mm -hmm. in, a, in this, you know, with potholes being so endemic right now, you know, 500 miles of roads and this kind of thing. So where do we stack up compared to other big cities? Because, I mean, I, I assume that, that, that that's kind of a cost of doing business. There's always going Absolutely. to be settlements Absolutely. over police. Uh, this is what we found. Uh, new York, they're spending on these cases outdistances Chicago. But it's basically they have three times the police force and roughly three times the population. Uh, so, you know, when you account for that, we're neck and neck with New York. Los Angeles have a, has a similar size police force, and their spending, I think, in the most recent year was a fraction of ours. So $20 million as opposed to 80-some-odd million we had last year. 
Um, Philadelphia, again, slightly smaller, but nine, 10 million. So, I mean, we are, you know, uh, basically winning a battle <laughs> here, winning a race that we, you know, don't want to be winning. Mm -hmm. um, and Did you look at the difference between, like, ongoing lawyers' fees to cover this, you know, to, to litigate the city's mm -hmm. liabilities versus actual payouts to victims. We did. We versus broke the cover up. We broke it all down. So that five hundred and twenty one million dollars that includes settlements and judgments. Um, that includes outside legal fees that the you know the defense attorneys basically that the city has hired to defend them in cases and you know various other court costs, plaintiffs' attorneys' fees that they lose in federal court. So I mean that's the whole sandwich right there. Um, again, I mean we said this in the piece. I mean there's certain intangible costs that we probably uh, couldn't even find, um, but I mean I think that's about the best number you're going to get out there is that 521 million. Um, now Rom says they're working on it, uh, they're taking steps to reduce that number, and but the thing about it is they have still have nearly 500 cases pending. So I mean this is going to continue to some rise. of these cases, as you say, Burge certainly, but some of these cases go back way before yes. the Rom administration. He right? did. I mean, and, and to his, you know, in <laughs> fairness to the administration, this is a problem that uh, you know they inherited in a mm -hmm. way. Um, I mean, a lot of these are legacy cases. They've been around for a while, and they've slowly been snaking mm -hmm. their way through yeah. the system. And if I'm not mistaken, I don't want to give credit where it's not due, but I do believe he did at one point say, I just want this stuff cleared yes. up, right? Yeah. I just want to get this all He did, and he apologized. You right. know, I mean, that was a big, I think that was a, a pivotal moment. I mean, because that's true. I mean, you know, uh, you know, that's not to say that some of these victims don't deserve the money. I mean, some mm -hmm. of the stuff that happened course, is just right, is, right. Is horrendous. Um, and they deserve to be compensated. I mean, I talked to Alton Logan, for example. He was a, a gentleman that you know, spent 26 years in prison, got $10 million from the city last year. I mean, he said to me, he said, yeah, I mean, the money's great. It ensures that my remaining years, he's in his 60s now, uh, will be comfortable. But he said, I, I mean, basically, uh, you know, he sort of, you know, step by step told me all the things that he missed while he was in prison. It's heartbreaking. It's mm -hmm. terrible. Mm -hmm. um, you know, the city clearly, I think, has a problem. Mm -hmm. and, and one that, um, you know, the criminal justice experts that I spoke with, you know, in their opinion, they don't think the city's doing enough to address this. Um, you know, yes, Ron wants to clear some of these off the table, but they said, that, I mean, there's a, there's a problem with the department. There's a reason why this is happening more often here than in L.A., And it's still, it's still happening. It's we're, still happening. We're, we're still getting more of these kinds They're of... Just they keep moving through. Mm -hmm. And granted, I mean, listen, there's been 1,600 cases in the last five years or so that have been filed. I mean, you know, in fairness to the police, a lot of these guys are doing great jobs out there, which is, in, in, you know, in, in often dangerous neighborhoods. It's a tough job. But um, what, these, what a lot of the experts seem to tell us was that it seems to be, you know, sort of the small core, if you will, of guys that, you know, names that keep popping up. I mean, they call them repeat abusers. And they think that the city needs to do a better job mm -hmm. of rooting those guys out, identifying these patterns. They think Not that would help. Not unlike the, what the police say about the shootings in Chicago, exactly. that it's a very small core <laughs> of using people. Yeah, using right. data. I mean, that yeah. same data would exist for the police, but they're not right. using on themselves. I yeah. mean, I think yeah. they've done a great job of, of identifying hot spots and, you know, yeah. pushing yeah. officers into those yeah. areas. So. so, Cheryl, you did a really interesting piece uh, about... Um, how if your house gets blown to bits in a tornado in Illinois, let's just pick a town like say, oh, I don't know, Washington, Illinois. <laughs> okay. You're not going to get compensated the same way if, as if you had built that house in Indiana. Well, Is let me right? be clear. Am I being wrong? You're, well, uh, yeah, okay, yeah. all right, okay, I'm wrong. N FEMA, the Federal Emergency Management Agency, provides two types of assistance and one is called individual assistance and the other is public assistance. So what happened in Washington, Illinois last November and in several towns around there, it was just the biggest one. Uh, these tornadoes just pour, poured through the area, um, demolished all of these homes, about a thousand of them. Uh, three people died. Um, and uh, so a lot of people were, you know, in dire need. Uh, FEMA uh, provides assistance to people after they go through their insurance companies, see what they can get from them. And, and um, um, the state uh, went to the federal government and said, we need help. This is a disaster area. Please agree with us. Please agree with us. And, and the president did. He just said, okay, nine counties, you're in terrible shape. You are a disaster area and provided individual assistance. So people who had their homes destroyed, people who needed to make repairs to their homes, who needed uh, assistance renting a place or whatever, you know, they did get money or they could apply for grants. So FEMA did help them out. Now here's the rub. So you have this town though that uh, has all of this debris over the place 
and is trying to to get place clear the place cleared out and has all these emergency crews coming from all over to help and wants to get things done uh, before it snows because they're going to lose the help they're going to lose the access and all of that so they applied the state applied for public assistance grants which means FEMA will help pay 75 percent of the costs that you incur for clearing out debris for any uh, damage to your infrastructure anything that's publicly owned um, so uh, they applied they didn't get it why because there are a couple of factors that go into uh, the, the, the determination. But one of the biggest factors is this formula that FEMA uses that says you have to meet a threshold of damage cost. And it, it's based on your population, and it's based on what they think a state can handle. Mm -hmm. So they say, okay, well, we're going to say that a state can pay a dollar thirty-nine per resident to clean up their cost. So then you take the population and you multiply it. Mm -hmm, All mm -hmm. right. So in Illinois, you have a population of nearly thirteen million people. Multiply it by a buck thirty-nine, you have a threshold of seventeen point eight million dollars. Okay. So if the damage from your tornado doesn't reach 17.8 million, that's your first threshold. Counties also have a threshold. But if the collective damage doesn't reach, reach that, then more than likely you're not going to get assistance from, hmm. um, from FEMA. Now, <coughs> if you lived in Nebraska yeah, yeah, yeah. and it was the same amount of damage, the threshold is much lower because there's less people. Yeah. So I I, I was interested in this, you know, because this is Chicago newsroom, not Washington, <coughs> Illinois newsroom. But mm -hmm. I was interested in it because we seem to all have this kind of paranoia that weather is just getting worse and worse, and that you know we could be hit here as as hard as they were. Certainly, floods. We seem to get floods all the time. So, are are, are we in a position where something like this could hit in Chicago, and a, a you know a, an F three or F four could run up the Stevenson or something, and then we we don't the get public the, assistance yeah. money wouldn't come to us well, if it was in chicago <laughs> you might have you might reach that damage amount mm -hmm. but it would still you would we would still have to meet that threshold wow. interesting um and you know if you want to be crass about it you could say well it's the people in chicago all that population that's causing the problem right, here right, right. <laughs> you know? well i mean as, so. as people in illinois have often pointed out <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> it's it's a state with this thing yeah. attached this tumor <laughs> attached up at the top where all the people are cause all the problems. <laughs> I must so. say, though, that the Washington, <laughs> the Illinois mayor was very uh, uh, generous, I guess, when he mm -hmm. said, you know, yes, it is, Chicago is big, but we're not blaming the yeah, city. Yeah, yeah, uh, yeah. And of course, then there's <laughs> they, also they the point that- They have helped us a lot. There's also the point you make that, you know, it depends on what the state can do, and we are the most bankrupt state in the nation. That doesn't count for anything, <laughs> right? right? It's but, like, but we you know, have no money. Right, have, but it's interesting, though, how, you know, the governor did find some money to- <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah. well, it's election it's year. It's an election year, yeah, yeah, yeah. But may I, may I move on, Tom? Um, a community media workshop guy. Uh, Cranes did a piece this week, Lynn Merrick did a piece, on hyper-local news and how none of it makes any money. And she particularly pointed out um, uh, DNA Info, which of course is the, the, I think that's the big one right now because they're, you know, they're, they're everywhere. They're yep. doing everything and we love DNA Info. We have them on the show all the time. And she says they're losing millions. Well, we don't know because it's a private concern, um, but I do think it suggests the new business model for at least uh, local news, uh, which the legacy media has had trouble um, keeping up with as their staffs um, get smaller. Um, the new news model seems to be find a guy who made millions somewhere else <laughs> and let him invest his money into a news operation. This We've is said what that over and over. The Ricketts like family the did in New York. Is the new journalism is find a rich guy. Yeah, <laughs> that's what's happened in the Washington Post. Right. Um, right. Um, and Ricketts decided to come here in Chicago. The product, the DNA product here in Chicago is, to my eye, a lot different than the kind of police blotter driven one in mm -hmm. New York. And um, yeah. we have a pretty rich staff that Seamus Toomey has put together here. But in the meantime, Patch is, you know, a shadow of its former self. Mm -hmm. That was AOL throwing a whole bunch of money mm -hmm. in and they finally got out of it. Uh, 
they probably lost or burned through over a hundred million dollars oh, trying wow, to make that thing wow. happen. Interesting idea, hyper-local, mm -hmm. editor in each community and mm -hmm. equipped with a digital recorder and video and a police scanner and go to town. It was a gruesome pace for a single editor <coughs> to file three stories a day, mm -hmm. at least one of which had mm -hmm. to be video. There just aren't that many school board meetings in Burr right, Ridge, right, right. Uh, or for that matter, Skokie, which had one of the mm -hmm. better sites going. I mm -hmm. think Miss um, uh, Swanson is still keeping the, the Oak Lawn one going. I know her from Uptown days when she covered mm -hmm. uh, in, in Rogers Park when she was with Lerner. Mm -hmm. So there, there's some efforts like that that are continuing, and of course, the community media workshop four or five years ago began looking at this movement to online yep. news, and one of the things we first discovered is that there were a lot of uh, kitchen table, cookie jar finance, labors of love. That was the mm -hmm. phrase we came up yeah, with. Yeah, I remember And that a lot of those hyper-local things really aren't around anymore uh, three, four years later because it's really tough to keep the mortgage paid or mm -hmm. e even yeah. coffee going when it's web ads and we know that web ads just yeah, aren't generating yeah. the income. And it's also incredibly hard work. And you it's can only do it for, you know, for a couple of years and it's like at some point you just have to say, well, there are a lot of young reporters doing great work for the, you know, it's the... It's a great the, way to start your... I started at yeah. Pioneer Press, I mean, up yeah. in the North Shore. That's what I did. Covered meetings, filed, you mm -hmm. know, sometimes as many as six, seven, eight stories a week. Mm -hmm. um, granted, we didn't have the... The web was just getting going at that time. I'm in my mid-30s, but, you know, I mean, we did post stuff online, but it was predominantly print-driven at the time. So, you know, feeding that beast, um, that's not easy. What? Rivet, you referred to earlier, Rivet Radio is trying to do is basically tap this um, big data uh, um, theme that we're hearing all around us as marketers and companies try to use the web to figure out a lot more about our personal habits, mm -hmm. including reading, mm -hmm. beyond just what we're buying. Somehow in there they're going to figure out, uh, because we're listening to you for two minutes instead of one minute, that there's, there's a connection here about the kind of content we need to continue to provide a certain cross-section of the audience that mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. will buy enough stuff through the ads we or, or some other mechanism. Right. I, I suspect we're going to see a return as all the legacy media continues to up their rates. Mm -hmm. I mean, I find myself beginning to re-examine the three papers I still get a day mm -hmm. because I can't believe what they're costing for mm -hmm. that much less content that I'm actually getting in, on, my, on my front porch Almost every like morning. they're pushing you onto the digital There's, yeah. there's, there's yeah. a digital yeah. world that's, yeah. that's amazing that yeah. I certainly tap as part of those subscriptions, mm -hmm. but the paper product is becoming obviously a, an anachronism and how we pay for that content we used to get that way, I don't think anyone's really figured out yet. Uh, and it's because so much of what's currently happening is private concerns, um, I don't know that we're going to have really good numbers, but I, I credit Cranes and Lynn for trying to capture what the current mm -hmm. picture might be at the mm -hmm. moment. I think the interesting part, though, about this is that it's always been my understanding that people want to know what's going on in their communities. Yes. And I, that's why I, th I think everyone keeps jumping into this pool because there's this sense out here that people want to know. Yeah, yeah. You know, I grew up in Evanston. You know, my parents got the Evanston Review. Yeah. You know, now yeah, there's a couple yeah. different ones competing up there. But people want to, I mean, they may not go to the village board meetings, but they want to know, okay, this guy's going to build this building up yeah. on the, you know, yeah. uh, on this street, this 3,000, you know, you know yeah. um, monstrosity. Well, you, you do also just get the feeling that maybe it's just a matter of it needing a little bit more time because, I mean, I, I will say straight up, I think DNA has got the formula. I mean, I think it it's a great it service. Looks good. And they're Journalistically. Really, yes. Mm -hmm. Journalistically, I think yeah. so. I think uh, visually it's a very nice looking but, website. But, you know, too. it's going gonna, it's gonna, to, it, anyway. It's doing what the news co-op never got around to it, doing. It absolutely is doing and, that. And, That's right. And so right. I think it has some staying power given the rickets deep pockets. And that's Hopefully. all we, that's the last word. That's it. We <laughs> burned through our time, too. So there you are. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much for being here. Cheryl Corley, NPR. Uh, Andrew Schrader from the BGA, thank you. this time sometimes. And, of course, our old friend Tom Clark from thank Community Media Workshop. Glad to have you here. You've been watching Chicago Newsroom. It's a community service of Can TV. You can see us on Can TV all the time, but you can also go to I, uh, iTunes and to YouTube. Check it out right here. You can watch the show anytime you want. I'm Ken Davis, thanking you very much for being with us today, and we'll be back again next week, I guess. Yeah, I'm sure we'll be back next week. <laughs> see you then. Bye.